Greetings, this is I, Tantus Nairvan Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome. It is time to continue our discussion on AD&D Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. I've been previously talking about being a dungeon master and the different things your characters will select that will affect your game world. We were talking about equipment, let's move into talking about damaging equipment. Now normally, under most circumstances, your weapons and equipment will not be damaged, unless something specifically says it will be. You can assume that there will be normal wear and tear on your equipment that as long as you're getting some kind of opportunity during downtime in order to repair it, it will be fine. Now, if something comes up that you're not getting that, then your dungeon master may say something to you, but otherwise, as the dungeon master, assume that their equipment is being maintained. Now, you can actually damage equipment by targeting it specifically with normal attacks or some kind of attack or with an area type attack some kind of area spell traditionally if i'm attacking it i have to worry about hit points and armor of said item if i'm using a spell i have to worry about its spades now let's talk about the attacking it attacking it is going to matter your matter on a couple of different things the first thing that's going to matter is what you're attacking with it what kind of attack you're using and how would it affect how would it interact with whatever i'm attacking now Whatever you're attacking, you might not have to have an AC for it. You might automatically hit it. It might have an AC, which is AC is going to depend on the size of whatever it is and what kind of material it's made of. Something that's harder will have a higher AC. Now, that's where the major interactions come in of me attacking it. The different material and different types of attacks is going to interact differently with whatever I'm attacking with. It could be that if I'm using a tiny knife and I'm trying to chip through a door, that's going to be hard and take a long time. I might not have to roll to hit the door, but I'm going to be like, this is for quite a long time cutting away at it, hopefully getting in. It's not a good matchup. Now, I could, of course, target a specific area on there that would be weaker, that would be more open to my attacks, but then I'm getting a penalty to set attack. It's harder to hit that spot there that's the weak spot that maybe perhaps I can damage it with a little better with my little knife against this door, like hitting its hinges or something. Granted, the book provides a list of hit points of many of these common items that you might be attacking, and it provides the types of attacks which are actually effective on it. All of this is going to be your dungeon master's discretion. The DM's discretion tells you what kind of AC an item's going to have, how many hit points it's really going to have, and how whatever attack I'm making will react to whatever I'm attacking. Now let's move into talking about those area spells, or area damaging effects, really. When I'm doing that, it, it, whatever it is is going to get a saving throw. Now, the saving throw depends on a certain things. If it's an unattended object just saying, like, lying down here, then it's going to get the saving throw dependent on the material it is, which I'll talk about in a minute. If it's carried by someone, it will get their saving throws as long as they are appropriate. If the thing, regardless of where it's at, is magical, it will get a bonus from 1 to 6, depending on how powerfully magic it is. If it's some kind of artifact, it will probably get a plus 6, while if it's just some kind of common magic item, it will probably get a plus 1. It is, again, going to be DM's discretion about how powerful that magic item and how much of a protective aura it will really have. The book lists a lot of common materials that an item could be made out of. You're going to look at the majority of the material the item is look, made out of and figure that's what its saves are based on. It will also tell you then the types of things it will be saving against, the things that will affect a item, and what their saves will be. Now, these different things, it talks about them in the book, what it means for these, what different types of energy or special attacks, what it really means when it's affecting an object. Now let's move on and talk about magic. Now the magic is basically the spells you're going to be learning and casting. And either as a character, you will learn the spells of your choice or you will have your dungeon master choose them for you. Now there are some options in the middle. You could have the DM and the player both take turns or some kind of combination of the two of them working out, choosing spells together. That's probably the most recommended because then the player can effectively be like, I'm suggesting this, the DM could be like, that's not appropriate, don't take that. That sort of combination of thinking patterns, or the dungeon master can come up with a couple of suggestions and the player can choose from one of them. Dungeon master could also go completely random when a person is selecting spells. Now, traditionally, a person gains one spell that they're going to be learning per level that they gain. At that point in time, of course, they would be selecting them or getting the random or the DM choosing them. The point of this DM choice is to keep 
get spells which are not important or detrimental to the game out of it. So if someone wants to learn X spell and you don't think it's appropriate for the game, you can keep that spell out of the game. Or if you don't think a certain number of spells would be appropriate at all, you can again keep them out of the game. Now players can learn spells of course by leveling up just as I said, one per level, but there are other ways of learning it. They can copy it from a spell book they've managed to acquire, let's say from an enemy. They can also copy it from a scroll. They can also copy it from a mentor who would lend them a spell book to copy from. Most of these require some kind of material costs in order for them to pay for it. The wizard spell book, which is what we're talking about really right now, is the most important thing a wizard will make, and because it's so important and any little mistake in the writing will cause the spell not to work, they, they do it for themselves. They make their own spell book meticulously, paying the cost for it. Someone else, another wizard, can produce spell books to spell to sell, but because that mistakes that might be made in there would make the spell useless and unusable, there are very few wizards, even less than the spell wizards that would actually make these spell books, that would buy these spell books to use because they wouldn't be very, they'd be cautiously optimistic that they would actually all work until they tested them all. Now, preparing a spell book, getting all the materials, copying everything, usually costs between 50 to 100 gold, just minimum basic, so that's how much it will cost them. Spell books usually have between 50 and 100 pages. The book gives a chart telling the various types of spell books that have different stages of size. Because spell books can call, come in all rank, sizes, shapes, archetypes, forms. They can come in a wide variety of them. Traditionally, a wizard will usually have a main spell book, a much larger one that they'll keep at home, around 100 pages, and then have a smaller traveling one with them that they can use to, when they're adventuring, around 50 pages. A spell takes up the level of whatever spell it is plus 0 to 5 pages. That's 1d6 minus 1. So if a spell book is 100 pages and you're rolling maximum every time for first level spells, you could get 16 first level spells in there and then be filled up and have to get another spell book. Higher level spellcasters will oftentimes have multiple spell books because they will fill them up. Because some of these spells, like ninth level spells, when you're getting up there, will take up a huge chunk of your spell book. That's at least nine, maximum 14, out of even a hundred pages if it's the big one and not the 50 page traveling one, which is much smaller. Now let's move on from talking about spell, cap cho spell choosing and spell books and move on to talking about the schools of magic because this is an important one to talk about. You as the DM can affect and change the schools of magic. Easy way to do this would be to enhance them by adding new spells. Now this is something that you would use only if it would be appropriate to the world and only if you think these spells would be appropriate to your game. You don't want to go too far and, and unbalance things, so you should be very careful in choosing your selection of spells that you might be adding in or inventing and keep that they are balanced with the level that you want to be. That's harder, but that is the easiest manner to do it in a way, but hardest to balance. The other way that you can enhance a school of magic and make it better is to add something like a college or a special area to learn the school of magic. Then specialized wizards of said school might be developed there or people that would more specialize in that type of magic and there would be an influx of spellcasters using it. Therefore, it would be more important in your world and therefore would be enhanced in comparison to some of the other schools. That's an easier way so less creative way of doing it, I guess you could say, because it doesn't have the flair of making up your own spells. So that's it for today. I talked about damaging equipment, all the using just a direct attack or an area attack. I moved into talking about the basics of spells, choosing your spells as you gain levels, making a spell book if you're a wizard, and in enhancing the schools of magic if you want to alter them for your adventure. In the next episode, I will talk about sp magical research and spell research and move into talking about experience. The most important thing for your character is what you use to gain levels. So if you have any questions, comments, anything you want to say, anything you think I left out, please leave in the comments below. Please like, share, and subscribe to support the channel, the empire, and the work I do. And until the next time, I bid you farewell.